There is no force acting on them. They're simply following the lay of the land. So far, general relativity has withstood exceptionally rigorous testing, including remarkable experiments related to gravitational waves. These tests provide strong support for general relativity as the most accurate description of gravity. Presently, the predictions derived from general relativity are testable and have been consistently validated by numerous experimental results. Now for the fun stuff. What's it like to fall into a black hole? Let's imagine two astronauts, Jack and Jill. Jack is going to leap out of a perfectly good rocket and fall toward a black hole, while Jill will stay behind. Jack, thinking it might help him get a contract with an extreme sports channel, dons his spacesuit and enters a small pod. He has a blue laser, which he will use to send signals back to Jill. As Jack falls towards the black hole, he begins shooting the laser in pulses, one pulse per second, and Jill watches him from the rocket, observing his descent. From Jack's perspective, the ship proceeds into the distance as he flashes the blue laser once per second according to his watch. Soon, Jill starts to notice something unusual. The farther away Jack gets, the longer it takes for it to receive the next laser pulse. Each successive pulse arrives later and later. Furthermore, the wavelength of each pulse becomes longer, shifting towards the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum. Lastly, the pulses become fainter and lose intensity. As Jack continues to fall, all of these effects only increase in magnitude. Jack notices the outside world becoming increasingly bizarre. The stars around him appear to be wildly distorted as their proper motions accelerate to astonishing speeds. Looking down, he sees the black hole looming below him, filling his downward field of view. He also starts to see devastatingly bright flashes of light from infalling matter accelerated to great speeds, colliding with other matter surrounding the black hole. Gamma rays start to increase due to intermittent cosmic ray-like interactions in the area surrounding the black hole. While the hole is dark, the surrounding space is teeming with activity. He is very near the event horizon at this point. Meanwhile, Jill still witnesses Jack's laser flashes, but they are now spaced very far apart, only about, say, once an hour. As Jack gets closer to the hole, the laser flashes are redshifted so dramatically that Jill must adjust her receiver to an AM radio frequency just to perceive them. She no longer sees the flashes directly, perceiving them only as faint radio signals waning ever weaker. If Jack had started with a dim laser, Jill wouldn't have been able to see it at all. Finally, Jack reaches and passes through the event horizon. From Jill's perspective, before he crosses it, she sees one last pulse from the laser. All the pulses prior to his plunge across the boundary came months or even years apart. Jack's last pulse was extraordinarily faint. In order to see his last transmission, Jill deployed a massive radio antenna array because the wavelength of the pulse had been stretched to tens or even hundreds of kilometers. After this one last blip, she never sees another flash from Jack. Down near the hole, Jack is unaware of all this. For him, all the laws of physics remain the same, as indicated by the equivalence principle. As he falls, he continues to experience time at a regular pace, ticking away one second at a time. Tick, tick, tick. He is still theoretically able to shoot a blue laser, so long as the black hole's environment can be dealt with by his little space pod. As Jack neared and crossed the event horizon of this stellar mass black hole, he felt some pretty strong tidal forces. It was pretty uncomfortable as his feet got ripped away from his ankles, which got ripped away from his knees and so on. He was completely and rapidly shredded and pulled apart. This effect is so extreme that even molecules were pulled apart to their constituent atoms, which then get pulled apart to under their quarks. It's kind of bad for Jack. Jack would have fallen towards the hull happily, without incident, for some time after he stepped out from the spaceship when he left Jill behind. But in the last few seconds, as he drew near the few Schwarzschild radii from the hole, his world became quite unpleasant. Once he crossed the event horizon, or rather, what was left of him, which wasn't much, plunged into the singularity in a tiny fraction of a second. Jack's fate, from the moment he waved goodbye, was to be crushed to infinite density in the singularity at the center of a black hole. Since Jill was a party to this event, we may surmise that Jill's relationship with Jack was somewhat strained. Now let's take a look at some of the effects that Jack and Jill experienced, first focusing on gravitational redshift. 
Gravitational redshift occurs when a photon emerges from within a strong gravitational field. For example, let's say some light-emitting process is positioned at about 10 kilometers outside a one solar mass black hole. It emits first at visible wavelengths of light. That light will be redshifted to infrared after it travels approximately 100 kilometers away and to radio wavelengths after it travels 10,000 kilometers. If the emission were X-ray light, which would originate in the inner rings of a black hole's accretion disk, such light would be redshifted down to ultraviolet and then to visible light by the time it travels 10,000 kilometers away. We again can define the redshift to Z to be the difference between the emitted and the observed wavelength of light compared to the wavelength at the moment of its emission. The equation at the bottom shows the wavelength we would observe if we were situated at a very large distance away from the black hole where gravitational stretching of space-time is negligible. Our vantage point, a thousand light years away, would suffice. Lambda sub E is the wavelength at emission and lambda sub lazy 8 is the far distant measurement. The big R sub E represents the radius from which the light was emitted and the little R sub S denotes the Schwarzschild radius. For example, the h alpha Balmerg transition comes from an excited neutral H atom at 656 nanometers. Let's imagine we were somehow able to identify that this transition had been redshifted by a black hole all the way to microwave wavelengths, observing that emission line at, say, 6.56 centimeters. The light from that hydrogen atom came then from approximately 0.03 millimeters above the event horizon. This was the final call of that atom before plunging into the hole. Atomic transitions are not really expected to be relevant at the event horizon. More likely are nuclear transitions, which would occur at X-ray wavelengths. So, let's say some nuclear transition rate occurs at, say, 50 picometers at the same tiny altitude above the event horizon. That would be redshifted down to about 500 nanometers, or visible wavelengths. The realistic amounts of large redshift, though, occur from light emitted from a range of distances, perhaps a few hundred Schwarzschild radii down to the innermost stable orbit of three Schwarzschild radii. This corresponds to the accretion disk found around black holes with companions or supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. So, let's take the three Schwarzschild radius as our typical value. An X-ray emitted from the inner edge of such an accretion disk will have a typical change in wavelength of about, of about 1.22 times the original. Thus, an iron K line at 0.2 nanometers would be redshifted from that origination point to about 0.24 nanometers. This might not seem like a lot, but it is enough to measure. The other significant concept we find from this catastrophic interpersonal relationship is the observed gravitational time dilation. For example, Jack's clock consistently shows that time passes normally one second at a time, and that's his metric for laser pulses he sends back to Jill. However, Jill observes and measures the intervals between the pulses of Jack's clock getting larger. This is a closely related phenomenon to the redshift. The redshift measures the interval of time between individual crests of the emitted light's waves, and the time dilation is a macroscopic view of that same event. Rather than individual wave crests, it is some big tick-tick-tick of some series of events. Thus, the time dilation is in some sense more obvious to Jill. The intervals are represented by delta t sub e and delta t sub lazy 8. They are related by the same equation as the redshift, which obviously arises from the definition of wave speeds. As a result of this time dilation, from Jill's perspective, Jack will never seem to cross the event horizon. This is because, as she measures it, his clock is slowing down more and more. If Jill could somehow view Jack and see the dim, redshifted light coming from him, she would perceive him as having stopped all movement, never actually crossing the event horizon. There would be a final image of him represented by a light reflecting off him. Perhaps he shone one directly on himself. Any light signal coming from Jack's location would be greatly redshifted. This was interestingly done in the sci-fi series Stargate, where the Gates planet collided with a black hole. The remote's team image was frozen. 
Also, the old anime classic Gunbuster featured a team coming out of a black hole's well to similar effect. This effect has been observed and measured in less extreme and nearer environments than black holes. The Hefele Kating experiment used atomic clocks on airplanes, comparing them before and after their flights on an average commercial passenger liner. The clocks aboard the airplanes were slightly faster than the clocks on the ground, depending on the direction they flew. Closer to home, the global positioning system would not work at all unless this effect is taken into account. Closer than a geostationary orbit, lab experiments have shown to measure the effect over distances of about a meter or so. The pound Rebka experiment is the classic test of this in the form of a redshift, and researchers using the Hubble Space Telescope found it in the spectra of the white dwarf Sirius B. In the solar system, it was measured in the signals between the Viking Lander 1 on Mars in 1977. Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is, this time dilation is a real thing. Again, R sub S is the Schwarzschild radius and R sub E is the emission radius for the signal. To make one second of jacks into 10 seconds of jills, jack would have to be about 30 meters above the event horizon of the solar mass black hole. It really was his last call back to her. Finally, we look at Jack's experience of spaghettification, which is the stretching and squeezing caused by the black hole's intense, non-uniform differential gravitational forces. It is non-uniform in the fact that gravity is directed radially inward towards the center of mass. For large objects like the Earth, Moon, and Sun, this is a subtle effect because up to a rather large area of the surface and up to some very large distances, the radially directed lines of gravitational force are roughly parallel. But once you have a big mass in a small enough region, the surface curvature of the object makes the radial lines of force diverge. It also means that the force of gravity between two nearby altitudes can be great. These combine to give very large tidal forces near a stellar mass black hole, and this will distort objects. Let's say we have four balls in a freefall toward a black hole. We see how the far one doesn't fall too much, but the near one does, and the other two start to converge in the middle. This is the essence of spaghettification. Normally, most materials' intermolecular and interatomic forces would keep the shape of the object. Under the extreme tidal stresses and strains near a small black hole, these bonds would not be enough to prevent the distortion. In Jack's case, as he gets closer to the event horizon, the difference in gravitational pull between his head and his feet becomes extreme. Soon, the force on his feet, which are closer to the hole, will be significantly stronger than the force on his head. Also, the convergence of the lines will force him to thin down, and his various parts simply cannot stay bound together. The outward keeping structure of his ribs would not be enough to prevent the inward strains. As a result, he would effectively be pulled into a long, thin shape, resembling a strand of spaghetti, hence the term spaghettification. Now, if Jack had fallen into a supermassive black hole, the physical size of the Schwarzschild radius would not lead to the effect above the event horizon, but would rapidly happen within it. For stellar mass black holes, though, it would happen above the event horizon. In either scenario, deep inside the event horizon, Jack would be squished to a point where he could be narrower than an atomic nucleus and ultimately the matter that makes up his body could be compressed down to scales as small as the Planck length. Meanwhile, Jill, sitting in her spaceship 300,000 kilometers away, watches this calamity unfold. From her vantage point, she would observe Jack getting stretched and distorted before ultimately disappearing into the black hole. The sight can be unsettling, especially as she drops a beach ball to test the gravitational effects, only to see it shredded by the black hole's force. If Jack had seen the beach ball torn apart, it might have made him reconsider his decision to jump, or not. We're not exactly clear on Jack's motives in this little tale. Now let's see what Jack sees as he plunges into the black hole. Here, rather than dropping straight in, he spirals around the black hole, dropping ever closer as he does so. As Jack gets nearer, he eventually passes through the stable orbits where he could have orbited safely. Throughout his descent, the black hole remains directly below him. 
Eventually, Jack crosses the event horizon, continuing down to the singularity. At this point, he is at the center of the whole. It is interesting to note that even when reaching the very center, Jack continues to see stars above him while the black hole looms as a vast plane below. Basically, Jack never gets to see the singularity because all the light is headed towards the singularity and none is headed away from it. At the center of the black hole is the singularity, which is a place of infinite curvature, where space and time as you know them come to an end. And the geometrical intuition that would suggest that the center of the Schwarzschild black hole is a point. Well, that intuition is misleading. If Jack had a friend alongside him while he fell into this black hole at the same time, but at some different location, as in a different latitude and longitude with respect to the event horizon, they would not approach each other as they approach the singularity. Rather, the diverging tidal force channels of the parts of their body along inward radial directions. Far from Jack meeting his other Doom companion at the Singularity, he would not even be able to put out his arms to touch her. The Singularity is not a point. Rather, it is a three-dimensional spatial boundary where general relativity no longer works or applies. Some new physics, presumably quantum gravity in some form, must replace general relativity at these singularities. In addition to being a boundary in space and time, it's also a boundary of our knowledge. This simulation comes from Dr. Andrew Hamilton, a prominent black hole researcher at the University of Colorado. He has extensively studied mathematics of black holes and published numerous papers in creating some amazing simulations. And so I've included a link to his work and I'll point out where you can find his materials on these websites. 